Welcome back to another episode of Self Care with Indy Jones. Today, as always, I have two wonderful guests. They're going to introduce themselves in just a minute. So I'm trying to get into the habit of saying this. So if you haven't already subscribed to the channel and you want to be notified of future episodes, please make sure that you, I heard people say this, smash that bell. I don't really like that. Just subscribe, get the notification, like this video, share with others, and comment. So now we're going to have our special guest. Again, they're going to introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump right into our questions dealing with self-care, resilience, and because we have two beautiful women here today, what it means far as Black womanhood. So Delicia, you want to introduce yourself, please. Hi, guys. I'm Delicia. Deli also known Delicia. Um, just to <laughs> add more pronunciation to my name. Um, but you can call me Delicia or D. Um, I'm an author by night, and a case manager by day. And again, thank you, Ms. Jones, for inviting me here to participate in this discussion. You did that way too fast. Wait a minute, we're going to pull that back. Talk a little bit about <laughs> your books. We want people to know and then let people know where they can find you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, come on. Okay. All that typical good author stuff. Okay, um, so I write paranormal romance and urban fantasy for young adults and for adults. Um, I tip fo my focus is on Black um, characters, so my main characters are always going to be women in of color. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> representation matters. Yes, um, you can always find my books on Amazon, and if you're interested in learning more about the stories that I write or just me as a person and an author you can always visit me at missjenkinsbooks.com right and your instagram oh and my instagram is at miss m-i-s-s -S -S underscore jenkins underscore books so you can find me there as well very good very good thank you thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can put all that stuff out there it's wonderful good stuff um and katara please Hello, my name is Katara, and I am a promoter. I do a little bit of everything, as we were discussing before, um, and I just love to see, I love just promoting books and, and just sharing books, especially Black women, of course. Um, I do actually have two books on their way to coming out. Um, I have a... Um, I forgot what, what category it's called, but it's 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 um, a devotional, 30 day, mm -hmm. yeah, 30 day devotional. And that's with my publisher right now. And I'm also working on a children's book, which nice. I am working with my illustrator right now, too. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and it's just I've just been it's been a crazy journey. Um, so I would love to I'm, I'm thank you, uh, uh, Indy Jones, for for asking for me and and also Miss Jenkins to uh, speak today. Oh man, that's that's wonderful. I know you was looking into authorship, and so you're doing nonfiction, Christian nonfiction, with with that, and then your children's book. So make sure when you have all that stuff out that you tag me and everything. I definitely want to support you, and I'm going to pre-order as soon as it's available. We're going to definitely do that. That's wonderful. This one I already purchased her books I'm always seeing stuff because like you said we have to support each other and and you've been doing that for a long time way before way before now and you're you're always a great supporter of of office Qatar so I appreciate that oh thank you now okay so I always ask this question I like to ask this question to really get up get us started because I think it frames it, it frames a lot of just who we are in our existence in the world although not so, solely but it definitely is extremely impactful. And so this is my question. And we'll begin with you, Katara. What does it mean to be a Black woman in the 21st century? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. You have to take on a lot. Uh, and you don't even, and sometimes you're not ready and sometimes you don't feel like it. 
So, but you have to take on a lot and, and be not only take a lot, but be aware of the system and be aware of even people are not even going to understand at times or they're purposely not understanding. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, it, it has its moments where you're just like, go away. I, I don't care at this point. I, I, I've said this to people. I, I don't care at the point. I do not care what certain other people think this is what's going to happen so you have to have that that you just have to have unfortunately you have to have and i don't like this term but you're gonna have to have thick skin in this world because if you don't this world will run you down for no reason at all <laughs> so it's 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 been challenging yeah mm -hmm. most definitely what about you delicia well, I'm just going to have to kind of piggyback off of what Katara just said. To be a Black woman, especially in the 21st century, means to be the villain and the victor, hmm. you know? <laughs> it's like we get blamed for everything, but then at the same time, we're expected to be the champion for everything and everyone. So which one is it? So that's pretty much what it means to be a Black woman. That's a great woman. way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a conversation that I can go on a a, a rant for days about. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's definitely tough. There's a beauty to it, but there is a toughness to it as well. And we talk about thick skin, and I know people say if you're going to be an author, you have to have thick skin. I don't think I particularly have thick skin. I'm pretty sure that I don't. But you notice sometimes when people fail to have thick skin it's almost like we're blaming them for not being you know tough enough instead of the situation that compels you to thicken your skin to be resourceful or resilient we kind of blame the individual for not being tough enough and we could probably talk more about that but I, I do find that to to be the case because some people they don't I think there are people who just don't come out the womb like that Right. And kind of doesn't matter how much you tell them maybe to, to toughen up. It, it, that's just not natural for people. I think from people who are even tougher doesn't mean natural for them, but they may have a, a greater capacity for that than, than, other, than other people. Um, mm -hmm. But you used the word, Delicia, um, victim. And what was the other one? Oh, villain and victor. So yeah, like the victor. You know, that's mm -hmm. like a book title right there, right? So, you know, you have to, <laughs> you're going to have to now sit down and write that book <laughs> with my sister as the heroine. You know, you do. I'm writing that down right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You think I'm joking. I'm literally writing that down. I mean, I just came up with the title. I feel like you and Katara would, would make <laughs> excellent co-writers. <laughs> now you talk about something right there. Right here live is, is how a book is developed. Everyone's seeing it right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That, that is, it's succinct, but there's so many layers to it if you mm -hmm. really peel it back. Okay, so now keeping that in mind, then we're going to begin with you, Delicia. So what words images and or people. So it's those three things, you have to do all three. Um, come to mind when you think of the word resilience, images, words, or people. Oh, powerful. I wasn't sure which one. No, oh. I was, it was um, Delisha, right? Cause you, 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 I think you oh. went first last time, Katara, yeah. I apologize, yeah. yes. So it's me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> When I think of resilience, I think of the strong Black woman narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about exhaustion. I think about suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think about silence. Mm -hmm. So those are the three things. Silence more because part of being resilient or what society's definition of resilience means the ability to stay silent through your pain. And the moment we start speaking out about things that are hurting us, now we go from victor to villain. You know, people always have a problem with someone who's speaking out against things that hurt, you know, cause harm. Mm -hmm. 
And when we think of res being resilient no, is no longer a compliment. I don't want to be complimented based on my, uh, my pain tolerance. I want to be complimented based off of my ability to heal. Mm -hmm. And because um, this is something that I've been low key pondering about, because these are discussions that are had on TikTok a lot and on okay. different social media platforms. And um, briefly, I, I yesterday I saw a YouTube video of this young lady who committed suicide. She was the mother of two young boys, and she, I think she's black. She's in, she's located in Houston. She might be mixed, but um, the point is, she had been posting on social media how exhausted she is how she needs a break mm -hmm. and I, I go back to many times where black women have came out and, and talk about being tired or if you see a black woman who has children away from her children now she's being judged like why aren't you with your kids because I need a break dang you know <laughs> And then so with her having a lack of support and then on top of that expectation to be resilient, to be that strong black woman, that crushing title alone is what's killing us. And so those are the things. So tying it back to your question, you know, the strong black woman narrative, the silence and the exhaustion. That's what I think of when I hear the word resilience. Yeah, in the it's that strong black woman piece is a trope. It's just mm -hmm. simply a trope. And I, I keep forgetting that every time, but I saw a great podcast on YouTube and it was about the black woman trope and the evolution of it. And, and it is problematic when it doesn't allow for the fullness of what it means to be a person. Mm -hmm. And that means having a multitude of emotions and the ability to be vulnerable. I had this conversation with two other women who actually they're going to their episode premieres. They're going to be episode three, so in a couple of weeks. And so we talked a little bit about what does it actually mean to be a strong black woman, but that doesn't necessarily allow for full vulnerability, if any at all. And I think that's kind of what you're getting to there. The another piece we talk about doing stuff on your own and and is that to be resilient, it doesn't mean that you are a solo, that you don't reach out to other people. And in fact, and I, I make sure I have this in the book, we talk about community, we talk about that later here too, but you don't have to do any of this stuff on your own. That does, that, that resilience doesn't mean that you don't go out and get needed support that you don't have friends or family and perhaps um, medical personnel who need to help you. Because if that's what you need, that's what you need to explore and take advantage of. But you have to know that those resources are out there. And sometimes it's whether you can even afford those resources, but being resilient doesn't mean that everything falls on you. You need to have a, a really nice community surrounding you to help you persevere. And studies do show about perseverance that that's really what moves people forward. Um, man, you, you, you're so succinct with, with, with your words. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm thinking about if that's really, truly how you write. You're really, really, truly um, succinct. And then you kind of like, I'm glad you added that extra piece because I think it needed to be said. Thank you. And Katara, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's true. I mean, so for you, Katara, what words, images, or people come to mind when you think about the word resilience? I look at powerful on one aspect, and another thing is against all odds and dealing with a whole lot, but still pushing through. That's how I look at it with resilience. Um, and just like Dee was saying, it it's 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 a label that that will be put on us, but at the end of the day that's not all who we are. We need to take a break. We need to do this. We need to just sit and relax. And, 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 and er, there's so many different, you know, we, black people are not monolith. We are not one type. We're all different types, you know? So some of us need more rest than others. Some of us need to withdraw more than others. Some of us are not going to deal with what others say. And some of us don't have time to explain 
uh, the issue, the problem, uh, the problems Black America, particularly Black women, are having in this country. We're not going to explain it. Some of us don't want to explain it anymore, and we're going to just keep going. So it's 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 a multiple thing. And once people realize, and and, and I know they do. There some so once we realize we're all different, they need to then they will stop coming at us like we're supposed to respond a certain way. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So I'm good with you, Qatar, and it's a, it's two questions, but you just, you can just answer one. I always give people the option of answering the one that they, that they will, that they feel most comfortable answering. So two questions, describe a time in your life in which you felt that you weren't as resilient as you needed or wanted to be, or describe a time in your life in which you felt truly resilient. Um. <laughs> well, I can answer both in one thing. Um, I've gotten that many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was uh, not with my my medical, uh, I like health professional job anymore. It was I didn't know what I was going to do. I felt like well, a failure. You know, I felt like what the heck? I've given these this, this company, my time, you know, put too much time in here. And then this is what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it was, it was, wow. But at, at the same time, I was just like, okay, well, let me do this. Let me, that's when I started. Well, this, that's when I really promoted my promotion business. And, uh, that's when I was started to look into other things. And that's when I, it, it started to my creativity to start coming out more and more. Um, that was a time it, it, and I didn't, I really didn't feel resilient at that time. I just mm -hmm. did what I had to do not to sit here and get, think like sad feelings or think of feelings that would not help me move on to, from a certain situation, you know? So um, it was just to keep, to keep my mind right. So. Okay, so yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you because it's, it's, it's like that bridge between when this issue happened with your place of employment, right? And two, you had this, this other piece. So what are some really specific things that you did or, do you, or that you had to keep reminding yourself to have a certain outlook that allowed you to get from point A to point B, because that's where that resilience, that's where sometimes that self-care takes place. So we oftentimes will say, well, I was feeling this way, but then I did this, but we don't talk about what is needed to get from one point to the next. That Good question. I had to just, and it was easy because I didn't live, I didn't work. It was my work at that time, that work was like 45 minutes away. So I had to just ignore everything, like anything, anybody that I knew that was related to that job that, mm -hmm. you know, I may see, I had to just ignore them. I blocked people on Facebook. I just ignored it, you know, like it didn't happen. Like they, I didn't know them. And I don't think I saw anybody, but it was like, even when I was near there, I just kept my head up and kept it moving. I, um, let's see. Uh, you know, I went out with friends. I talked to people. Um, I think I, I went, I did a trip, actually went to trip to DC, um, just to visit some people that I, that were in actually the radio show. So it was, it was just staying busy and not, not able to, if I did think about it, I thought about it, but I wasn't, you know, I, I, I blocked it out. I don't know if that's the good, a good thing for other people to do. But yeah, I blocked it out. I didn't think about them or whatever. And if I did see them, I think I saw them, but they didn't see me at like a gas station or something. I pretended like I didn't, you know, that was somebody that I didn't know. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's it like I pretended like they were strangers. So that's what I had to do. I had to just block out the negative and kept moving. Um, even... Um, yeah, that was a another thing. That was a hard time because I didn't even get unemployment because Florida states the state for unemployment was crazy, you know, at the time. So I really had to concentrate on what am I going to do for work? 
what am I going to do for this? It worked out because I was able to spend more time with my son. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit more involved in my church that I was going to. Um, and I was, I was getting, like I said, creativity and I was able to read books like yours, Indy mm -hmm. Jones and yours D. So it was, it was, it was just in brick throwing myself into other stuff. So I'm not thinking about other things. So that's what, that's what I did. Yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot. And I think Pete, that is a strategy. And I can't say because I'm not a therapist, whether that's the like, you know, the healthiest strategy, because sometimes we definitely do the ignoring stuff that doesn't exist. And sometimes exhausting our, our efforts into another into another part because we don't want to think about that. Um, and that's probably the whole conversation with that strategy. But that is what what you did. And people do exactly what you just described, right? What about, what about you? You're um, a time in which you felt resilient or maybe not so much. <clears throat> um, I think I was more resilient in my twenties. And I'll say this because I was in an extremely toxic relationship with my daughter's father. And um, I'm healed from it, you know, I've gone through the whole process of healing and letting go. And I'm at a very peaceful, place in my life right now but throughout my entire 20s um it's really hard to pinpoint because <clears throat> excuse me there was so much that came with him um because he looking back he had a lot of demons that he was dealing with so his demons became my demons or they were, at least were trying to and um so with his demons came a lot of self-sabotage and a lot of like behavior that was destructive that affected my life. Mm -hmm. But throughout that relationship, I still stayed, you know, <laughs> because that's a, so that's a whole separate conversation is in itself. But at, when I stayed in that relationship, I, I felt I was more resilient than, than because I was, ex I was dealing with, I was capable of dealing with all of that and still getting up to take care of my daughter still holding out hope because I, at, there was a period in my life where I was really struggling. Even after I got my degree, I was struggling to find work. And it just seemed like everywhere I turned, everywhere I was applying for, it was a no. It was a no, 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 we went with someone else. Then on top of that, I'm dealing again with his stuff. And I just kept telling myself that it was gonna get better. Like that was the only way I could get through each day is that it was gonna get better. <clears throat> And um, so when I exited that relationship, that's when everything, all of the other opportunities started opening up for me. I, could, I had to turn down jobs and opportunities for employment. Like that's how much that was coming for me. And um, I, now that I'm here in my 30s, I don't have the same type of resilience that I had when I was in my 20s. If someone even, I, I'm just so traumatized that if someone even tries to come at me with that same level of nonsense, the same level of disrespect, the same level of inconsideration, I gotta go. I can't, <laughs> I will not hesitate to, to get the scissors and cut the cord. And that applies to any, any kind of relationship, whether it's rom romantic or platonic. The resilience that I had for people and their problems, being empathetic, being open, I don't have the tolerance for to this day. Um, so uh, in short, that was the period that I felt like I was more resilient. I was more tolerant um, of these, like uh, the best way to describe it is like, you know, like those rocks that sit in the ocean that deal with all of the waves and the tides and like the crash and roll of the ocean. And then slowly it's being chipped away. That was me. <laughs> so now that I'm free of that, um, I, I feel like I'm resilient when it comes to like holding on to vision, like a dream, the dreams and goals that I set for myself. But outside of that, I have no more resilience. I have to go. And I think, because I'm really listening to you and, and I think the way we look, maybe how you're framing resilience is maybe not exactly the way it is because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're that you're beaten and worn down right you're going to 
marshal up the strength to meet whatever that goal is, to take yourself where you need where you need to be. I wouldn't argue that you're less resilient. You know what part of the difference is? You may have less opportunity to be that heightened level of resilient that you was when you were in what you label as a toxic relationship because that is such an extreme situation on a daily you removed yourself from that high stressful situation. So now I think you're looking at you don't have to be resilient. You you are resilient. You definitely are, but you don't have to deal with that extra piece, that extra big rock on a daily basis. So you don't have to have that heightened sense of resilience because you aren't feeling threatened in various ways on the daily. So I wouldn't dare argue that you're probably more resilient in your in your 20s than you are now, because now you've come out of a situation and because of the experience, you are more cautious, more protective of yourself, and the and it makes a lot of sense that that you are, and so you not you're you're saying to yourself you're not going to ever allow that type of situation in the big way or small way if you can help it to ruin what you've built for yourself. To me, that is absolutely resilience you're not that pebble that's or that rock that's been pushed down 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 to um a pebble because if that was the case you simply would not be here you would be that's exactly true. like that person that that you that you talked about um and i, I want to say that because i don't think resilience means that you just take a beating resilience i think is standing up for yourself in a multitude of different ways it is saying that I am here, I'm important, I'm valued, I'm me, and these are the things that I need for myself. That's what you did when you left. And that's, I think that's probably exactly what you're still doing. You kind of almost recreated yourself, or maybe you just refound yourself. Um, I don't know, but- I appreciate what you're saying. What you're saying is absolutely true and correct. I think I'm still- when I hear the word resilient, I do feel a little triggered because I, I've had so many negative experiences where I've had to kind of be resilient. It's, it's one thing if you're being resilient more in a positive way, like as you're trudging through, you know, maybe getting your degree or I don't know, just everything yeah. outside of dealing with other people or persons that bring negative situations your way. Um, so... I, I, in this conversation, I, I, you are absolutely correct, correct, as far as this new person. It's just me kind of struggling with the positive aspect of the word resilient. Understood. Am and I, I making think, sense? No, you, you are. And I thank you for sharing that because I know it's, it's deeply personal. And we talked about this before, right? Before we start mm -hmm. the recording. And I appreciate you sharing that because it's a truth for probably more women than we really want to admit or, or think about. And it's a struggle on a lot of different levels. And I think you're, the, point that, the, the point that you're out of that relationship and you're still struggling with it because it impacts your life even when you, you are no longer there. Because how could it not, right? How can it not? And and I think, so when you guys talked earlier, I was thinking about, I think Angela did say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what, I'm just saying that what you shared, I think is important. I think it will resonate with a lot of women. And these are conversations, again, I think that needs to be had. Everything we're talking about are points and, and experiences and emotions that people are constantly grappling with. And it's okay. We should be grappling with these things. And we shouldn't be afraid to have these conversations. We shouldn't be afraid to seek perhaps um, medical help if we need it bec because you know we do how can you come out of it and maybe not um have have that and still be maybe bruised in different places even though you've healed others it's a journey and it takes a while and the you that you are today 10 years from now you're going to look back on yourself and you're going to have a somewhat of a different perspective because you have had an additional 10 or 15 years of, of growth and experiences. And you might look back and say, man, I can't believe I thought or felt that way then. 
because you feel differently now because of what has transpired in your life. So again, I thank you for, for sharing um, that with us. All right, so could talk, well, who's first? No, Delisha, you're first with this one. So, and I know you say, um, you know what I'm going to do, because you said a really important word, which was trigger. So I'm going to go a little bit off what I'm going to ask you. I talk about emotional triggers in, in the book. And so when you think about yourself and, and, your, and your triggers, so I have a pages in there and, you know, we have, you know, we, women, we have all different types of looks. So sometimes when you're triggered, your, your face expresses that feeling. It could be sadness fear, happiness, love. And so we have a different way of showing it. So a lot of times, if you know exactly what your affect is, when you are triggered, it's really help you to prepare for when things into your life that you that you don't expect. So Delisha, when you think about your trigger, so I'm not talking about necessarily a negative way, it could be like I said, fear, sadness, anger, but do you know what your triggers are and how to kind of prep yourself for them when they, when things come up that you aren't expecting? I'm still learning all of my triggers and how to deal with them. I do a lot of like daily self-reflection. I'm constantly thinking and processing. Um, but for the most part, when I know or how do I deal with my triggers? A lot of times I'm fully aware of what's about to happen. Mm. So then I plan accordingly, you mm. know. Um, if it's something that's going to be emotionally um, uh, emotionally triggering, um, I might have a mental breakdown and just cry in the bathroom <laughs> or something, you know. Um, thankfully, I haven't had to, I haven't had too many experiences where I, was triggered so badly, you know, in a public, fa you know, fashion or form. A lot of times people don't know I'm triggered. Mm -hmm. I just, I just leave. Right. <laughs> if it's really that bad, sure. I just remove myself. I know how to get myself out of uncomfortable situations. Right. But in the privacy of my own home, um, usually I, I'll go, you know, do a release, what I call a release. I'll just cry or, or journal, or sometimes I just sit and stew, Yeah, you know, stew in my own emotional. What's a happiness trigger? Then Katara, I'm going to move to you and, and we could talk about um, that as well. But what is a happiness trigger for you? What, what's something that happened and that is just like, man, it just gets you, you feel so joyful. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Lately, it's, um, oh, it makes me feel joyful. Uh, just the journey I'm on now, um, just writing my books and just getting closer with um, God and just seeing things that I haven't seen before or looking at situations now. And I, you know, I'm glad and, and, and I, and I can, understand it more than I did when I was younger, like five years ago, or just glad that I'm over certain situations and certain people. Um, we all know on social media, we can, like a post will trigger us to, to respond. And now I'm scanning past like, you know what, let's move on. <laughs> you know, I'm realizing that I don't need to respond to everything. Mm -hmm. I'm realizing that uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do this no matter what's going on. I don't care what, what um, you know, a lot of things that bothered me didn't bo don't bother me anymore. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, so what? Can we move on, please? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it being in a great place, being in a great place, even with this this new job, I, uh, uh, Indy, I was telling you about, even with this new training and this, the new job that I, or the new, the company that I joined, I am more comfortable than I would have been in my old jobs where if something happens I'll just deal with it you know so it's just understanding um that things are going to happen let them you stay calm you know and you do what you have to do and it will it will work out itself sometimes we want to control everything mm -hmm. and now I'm, I'm realizing you know what this is going to work out itself 
and you know i'm trying not to i'll just I, I may worry about it but i'm relaxed worried if that makes any sense I do. you know it's on my mind then i'll just think of something else oh okay well i'm gonna read Dee's book right now it's out so i'm, I'm getting into that oh uh, Indy has a new sci-fi book yeah well I'm gonna go do that and I'll worry about that later you know so it's just getting to a place where you you're you're letting things happen if that makes sense it does and and I think both of you are saying too it, it you know with age like they say you know you, you you become a bit wiser and but it takes a while especially if that's not a natural part of your personality to get to a part where you can say I'm not going to let this bother me or I'm not going to let it bother me as much as I typically would. Because sometimes we just can't just shut, can't, you know, you have to um, understand your emotion, you have to embrace it, but it doesn't mean that you have to, um, but you can control how you choose to respond to your emotions. And speaking of that, so I'll begin with, with Katara and I have a, this is one, I, I think I add this question. So, um, what lessons have you learned? Let me back up. Um, what did you learn about emotions growing up as a kid? <laughs> People look at, when I was emotional, I get, I get emotional over little things. People look at you funny. People say, okay, you're too sensitive. You're too mm -hmm. this. Yet right. when I start toughening up, they then they're like well well I'm sensitive so you can't I'm like wait a minute wait a minute you just said I was too sensitive so there's a lot of um what what do you say it's a lot of hypocrisy with emotions mm -hmm. um we're not supposed to be sensitive we're not supposed to do this we're not supposed to do that it's it goes back to resilient we're supposed to take it even though we have to work twice as hard we're, we're not supposed to cry or do this this that and the third um, that's what I learned about certain emotions on, 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 like in, in, in general, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, at home, it's different. You can, you can roll, you know, relax, de uh, you know, de-stress. That's when you're supposed to cry, even though that never worked for me, <laughs> that rarely did that work for me. So it's, it's, it's like, and now, um, looking back i'm like hey they're dealing they're going with this they're going through this and a lot of people say well this generation is this this and that i'm like shoot we went through that too it just wasn't on social media mm -hmm. it just we it, it was covered up you know <laughs> so it 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 um there's a lot of hypocrisy with emotions um and black women and black men as well but you know, on this topic, a lot of hypocrisy with emotions and black women and what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. Okay, thank you. And so Delicia, um, so maybe, you know, we I do look at kind of like emotions in the book and I think a lot of our approach to emotions is based on how we were raised. Whether sometimes it's not a situation where your um, your family will tell you exactly how the, how you should react, but sometimes it's the modeling of, of emotions in, in the family. So that's kind of like my, my question, like what did that emotions look like in, 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 your, in your family? And maybe now, as Katara said, what do you feel about emotions now? Oh, child. Um. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just giving you so much stress right now, man. Oh, man. oh Lord. Um, I feel like I'm in therapy again. These are things that I talked about with my therapist. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I grew up in, so I had military parents. And so when my mom had to go on a ship, my grandmother got power of attorney over me and my sister. Uh, my grandmother's from the South, you know, Mississippi. She comes from a generation, a different generation where we talk about resilient. <laughs> those, were that, those that were born in like 1932, <laughs> 1940, their mindset and their approach to life is all about strength. Mm -hmm. And so my sister and I were both like considered very sensitive kids. I mean, you tell us something wrong, we cry. And then what was the response for a, a typical black household? I'm gonna give you something to cry for. Now you're crying oh. even more because you're being threatened. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, I, 
I think that in a lot of black households, they try to beat the sensitivity out of you. Mm -hmm. And that is like, ma'am, sir, that's not helpful. Like you're just setting me up for more therapy (laughs) when I become an adult, you know? Mm -hmm. And so now um, I explore, I spend a lot of time exploring my feelings, you know, like just kind of letting it like simmer in it. And as far as my child is concerned, I allow her to feel what she feels. If someone hurts your feelings, you Mm -hmm. have every right to feel that way. Exactly. If someone does something to you that you don't like, you have every right to feel that way. However, I do try to teach her because I've had to work on this myself. Feelings are temporary. So it's a temporary moment. Most of the time we think we're going to cry forever. We don't. Mm -hmm. We move on to something else that we're going to cry for or get upset by it emotions are forever changing so I do tell her to be mindful you know be present in how you feel and you can't be ruled by your emotions and I think that's what those that came before us were trying to get at but they didn't know how to express that because they got beaten too so that's just my take on it no I mean it's wonderful and you you keep bringing up these great points both of you and it is a conversation that we can't have it here. And so hopefully whoever listens to this will, will go out and have this conversation. What about the violence within the Black family, right? And, and this, I think it's such a carryover from enslavement and that mentality. Like you said, I mean, I, I you know, we've heard that. We, we sit and we joke about it. You have comedians and they, and they use that as like a punchline. And I guess that's like, that's an unintended double entendre, that's punchline. But, you know, I'm going to beat this out of you. But you have to think about that. And we still we still have that. I've seen, gone out and I've seen sometimes how, you know, you know, have these tough boys. And so sometimes I see moms hitting, I've literally seen moms hit their, their male sons in the chest, little boys. And they think that, you know, they have to toughen them up. And, and because that's what a man's supposed to be. And she doesn't want, I'm not going to say the words, you know, that some of us use far as what type of uh, boys that we're raising. And, and it's all passed on those emotions, it's all passed on how they also perceive black women, but it is a place to talk about some of those beatings and, and the violence that takes place within, within our homes that we say is not necessarily what we think about as abuse. And, you know, is it a spanking? Is it a beating? Is it a whooping? We know what all that stuff means, but there's a conversation that definitely can take place because it's not helpful. And like you said, it is very much harmful, but where did it come from for them? Do they really you know, know better or did they, they know, but they don't know how necessarily know how to stop that cycle. And that's the reason why I asked that question as far as how, how were you raised as far as your beliefs and emotions. And the second piece is always, what do you believe now? What do you do now with your emotions? And both of you guys answered that and really apply it to yourself and and it really looks at what do you do for that next generation because at some point we have to stop that cycle and that we can only stop it by being conscious of it being critical of it and then being deliberate in our actions and so what you both described was doing all of that all of that so let's let's shift a little bit into the self-care and Alicia, I think I'm going to have you answer this one. So um, what are some things as far as self-care that you that you consciously do, that you're saying that I'm really doing this for my overall health? And in the book, I, I lay out like seven different types of self-care. So we look at, you know, like um, professional self-care, physical self-care, spiritual, which doesn't necessarily mean religious, but it could. I know Katara talked about her faith. But you know, you have spiritual self-care, financial. I'm not sure if I said that one or not. So what are, what are some things, some actions that you take that um, build your self-care routine? That's that's part one. And the second part is what are some aspects of your self-care that you know is maybe lacking that you're gonna say, it's one thing I, I really need to start doing. I'm gonna start doing it, let's say tomorrow. So two parts, what are you currently doing and what is at least one thing that you want to add to your current self-care? 
Okay, so every couple of weeks ago, get my toes done. Um, <laughs> it's something I feel like I deserve it, <laughs> you know, make sure I go get my toes done. Um, I take bubble baths and like my, my bubble bath routine is a, it's a whole ritual. I have candles lit, bring my stones out. I have like frankincense, like the little bricks and I have like a burner. Mm -hmm. um, so I do that um and then that whole ritual of cleansing you know I wash my hair um I'm still learning different ways to take care of myself um as far as spirituality um I do pray but I don't identify with uh the dominant faiths I'll, yeah. I'll just leave it at, at that yeah. and that's a whole separate conversation um because you know, when people tell you to go to go to Jesus or go to God and it's like, well, how, you know, like how, what am I? So what he gonna do, you know, and, and it's no disrespect to the faith. And I still believe in Jesus, but the approach that is kind of instilled on people, like that's the only way to, to heal yourself. No, it's not. Um, I do a lot of journaling. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have an interesting journal that my best friend sent me. I posted a picture of it, but I'll send it to you guys. So, okay. cause I don't know if I can say it on YouTube, but it's actually very instrumental in helping me. Um, like when you're angry, you like purge and all of that stuff. So I do a lot of writing. And then what was the other question? Um, what am I lacking? Well, yeah, something that you think you may want to adopt. And you did say that you're still learning um, maybe what to do, but what's something, an area where you think, man, I really need to be better in this area as far as your self-care? Um, I really need to get, so I haven't had time, like I, last time I went to my therapist, it was like in September. And since then I haven't had a whole lot of time to meet with her. So that's an area because there are things about me that's still very raw. Right. So, um, continuing my mental health care yes is something that I really am passionate about like I really need to focus on um, because I've come so far I don't want to go back mm -hmm. to those old unhealthy habits and then um, another thing um, I did learn this week because my daughter was over at with her dad and her grandmother I had a whole week of peace like, I didn't know what that felt like because I'm right. always on the move and always doing something. And I want to take more time to myself where I just do nothing. No writing, no phone calls, nothing. Just right. being. And it felt good. And it felt good. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. Um, so what you're going to do, do you make, make that next appointment? right because mm -hmm. yep. you say it but we have to like write that down so in the book I have um I created a document a form and I just called it you know um, a week of self-care and I do professional development on this as well and I literally just give people time during our session to map out at least one week hopefully they'll do more but we don't always have time but at least one week of exactly for each day, what are you going to do? And it could repeat, you could have more than one thing because everything doesn't take a long time or even be expensive, but something to, to for it to be deliberate so we can start to have it part of our natural routine. So if you haven't done um, seen your therapist since in September and, and it could just be, I guess, are they doing um, virtual like we're doing here? I, I know a mm -hmm. lot of doctors are doing that as well. Yeah, they're doing, it's it's, it's virtual. It's virtual. And it's okay. nice to have someone to check in with every week because I, I, I tend to be very self-sustaining and I ref, I tend to go like rely on my own self-counsel. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not, that gets a little unhealthy. Gotcha. So it's nice to have some unbiased person right. come in and be like, no, <laughs> I think you're looking at it from this, the wrong, a negative perspective. Why don't you try it this way? Right. So. So Monday when the work week starts, that's what you're going to do. It's to say, yes, yes, yes that's what you're going to do. And yes. at some point during next week, I will remember. And then I'll probably send you just be like, hey, did you make that appointment? No nagging. Just it's going to pop in my mind just, just to follow okay. up. But it's that is really important because what you mentioned is one of the seven um, 
one of the seven types of self-care, which is psychological, that, that whole um, uh, mental, emotional piece. So that was really important. So thank you. And then Katara, talk a little bit about maybe what your self-care looks like, and then maybe one or two um, tasks or understanding that you may want to include in your routine. Um, yeah, well, it's changed. It was reading. Um, now it's reading looking at videos, just getting away from reality, looking at different types of videos, um, fake, social media. Um, uh, I, and recently I did get my toes done, so that felt good. Uh, you know, getting hair done. Um, I'm looking into, you know, that, that type of thing, just beauty tips and, and just feeling good and everything. And, um, just when I have some time to myself, uh, just not doing much at all, um, even if I feel guilty doing it, you know, right. something like that, that's feel guilty. Um, and something I need to work on is not, a double-edged sword here, not going to social media before I go to bed, maybe yes. a half hour, uh, just yes. relax. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah something like yeah so that that's that's more that I need to work on just just still relax uh and not thinking of things and letting my mind just go and 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 you know be it watching something else or be it um uh be it just uh, not being feeling, you know, yeah, just doing something to take my mind off what's what's going on every day and stuff. So, yeah. The social media piece is huge. I think, like I said, when I do professional development, some of what people put in there, especially when they take the self-care checklist, I do have one in the book, is, um, you know, are they getting enough sleep? Sometimes part of your routine may be going to bed an hour or two earlier, cutting down on, on the social media. And a lot of times, you know, we wake up in the morning and, and I'm just as guilty of it. And the first thing I do, you know, I'm looking at Instagram, I'm looking at my email. It's, it's, we're so tethered to, you know, all of our devices and, and, and it's critical. I mean, we, we, we see how actually during this pandemic, how important it is to have all this stuff, but it is, it is um, addictive. And I know I'm, and I can feel it sometimes, you know, I can definitely feel it. It's not anxiety. We have this Pavlov thing, everything dinging on the phone and we're like, oh, you know, I have... so part of that sometimes is just decompressing from that and just putting some distance between you and social media. And, and even like you said, not commenting, I typically don't comment on any of that stuff. I just, I read it and think I have a lot of thoughts, but I won't make a post about it. I, I don't feel a need to comment on something um, at all. I, I just really just love it. But if it's something that I just dislike, I can just pass that by. I don't need to let that poster know how I feel about it. It's not, it's not critical. I don't know that person. And sometimes it's just adding to an awful well that's already there that people feel a need to just say any, anything. Uh, so I think you made a great point about about the impact of social media. So I'm just gonna ask you ladies two more questions as we wind down our time together, which I thank you for. So our next to last question is, Delisha, I'm gonna ask you this question. Complete the sentence, I am. <laughs> um. <laughs> we'll laugh, we we'll laugh at <laughs> Um. You know what? I am magical. I always post a lot about being magical. I don't think I am magical. Love it. Love. Oh, see, I have all these little notes down here. <laughs> I write this down right here. I, that I love it. Okay. So um Qatar, um, complete this sentence. I love. I love peace. That that was the first one that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. I love peace. Yeah. Again, on episode one, um, Kamisha Jure Hodge, that's exactly how, that was exactly her answer. She said she loved peace and she kind of went on and, and explained it, but same thing, same thing. And it, it is something about 
the fact that we have to even state that. Why is that a thing? Why is it a thing that peace having to come to, to a Black woman's mind? And sometimes I think it goes back to how you answered the first question, what it means to be a Black woman in, in all of its fullness. And all that fullness is not always what you want it to be to the point where you say that um, you love peace because it's many other things that you love. And then a final question, and Qatar, I'll begin with you. And it's definitely open to interpretation. So what is the color of your resilience? Oh, the color of my resilience. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, my first, my first, um, well, I, I guess blue and purple. <laughs> <laughs> Purple, yeah, purple is just royal. Um, right. Blue is more of my favorite color. And then black is a, a, a color I like to wear. I like to right. choose as well because it's just, well, as Dee said, it's magical. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Delicia, what is the color of your resilience? Uh, Katara said it it's blurple, blue, and, <laughs> blue and purple. <laughs> oh, you got to have me write down blue and freaking purple. <laughs> yeah. so I always love the color blue. Really? Um, I, yeah, I, blue is one, is one of my favorite colors. It's actually, I wear a lot of blue. Um, I don't know if it's like people are wearing like for color healing purposes. Um, I have like a lot, a few stones that are blue, like mm -hmm. lapis lazuli. Yeah. That's one of my main stones that I wear, you know, on my person. I don't have it on now. Mm -hmm. I have on, what is this? Um, this is laboradite. Mm. But um, I usually wear some blue or amethyst stone around on my person, somewhere on my person. Um, checking my fingers. Yeah. I didn't put it on today. So. Wait are, are you, are you February? You I'm September. Everything. You're September. Now, Katar, mm -hmm. you're, you're February, right? Am I? Did that just make that up? I thought both of us were Aquarius. Yes. Yes, I'm Aquarius. Yes. <laughs> okay. So when you said that, Delisha, I was like, maybe maybe she's also an Aquarius, but you just you just like amethyst. Mm-hmm. All right. Ap ap amethyst and lapis. lapis. Those are my two favorites. I wrote that down. I wrote that down. See, that, that makes sense. That's why we're all here today, because we all like amethyst right there. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. So I have blurple for, <laughs> for, for, both, for, for, both, for both of you uh, ladies. Well, listen, that is our time um, today for another episode of Self-Care with Indy Jones. And again, I would like to thank my wonderful guests. We have um, Qatar here and we have Isha Jenkins. And Qatar, um, I don't think you ever share like how people can find you online because you said you have a you have a business, right? Yes. yes. Um, find me at uh, Facebook Katara Johnson. Um, you, I'll have the uh, uh, the character waving, and she sort of looks like me with glasses waving. That's me. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 feel free to message me anytime. Um, and and that's the best way you can contact me. Uh, for, for promotions, or if you're just having a special thing where you just want me to share it one time, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's where best way to contact me. Perfect, perfect. I want to make sure that you, you share that. So again, I want to thank everyone for stopping by. I This was a great conversation, and I thank you both for, for participating, and i like to thank our audience for um just coming out. And again, if you haven't had opportunity, you know, like this video, share and subscribe and stay tuned for our next episode of Self Care Saturday with ND Jones. Stay safe, stay healthy and be resilient. Thank you.